Acts chapter 9. Uh, you can be seated. Acts chapter 9. It's a scripture in Corinthians that says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. I never really understood what that meant, but I'm beginning to. Where the Holy Spirit is allowed to be Lord, then there comes liberty, then there comes freedom. You need more than just a teaching of God's Word, and I... I, I would never undermine that. The teaching of God's word is crucial, especially. Ooh. Anointed teaching can break open a region. But then there's teaching without the unction of the Spirit of God, without the anointing, the, the, the enablement, the, the breath of God on it. It's true, certainly, that God sends forth His Word and it doesn't return void, no matter how unanointed we might be. But where there's the anointing, the yoke breaks, the burden lifts. But it's not just teaching that you need. If all you do have has the Word, then you... You will dry up. Then again, if all you do is have the Spirit, you will blow up. Some of you know some people like that. They blew up. It's so insane. Attributing to something going on in this front row. I ain't even going to look over here. It's, it's uh, scary over there. You need the word to grow up and the spirit. You need both. If you just have the word, you'll dry up. If you just have the spirit, you'll blow up. You need both to grow up. You need both. You need both the spirit and, and the word. I heard the Lord say to me in preparation for tonight that he's bringing people to the watershed. That's what I heard him say. Which is a whole lot better than the woodshed. <laughs> you all remember the woodshed, don't you? You know what the woodshed is? Does anybody know what the watershed is? I'd ask Siri, but I found that she can be a false prophet many times. <laughs> Have to go look it up, but to give you the Wikipedia definition, but I'll summarize and give my own definition. Watershed is two different meanings. One has to do with a body of water coming in confluence of rivers and water coming, meeting us to watershed place. But in application, what I felt like the Lord spoke to me tonight, about tonight, and not just about tonight, about the whole week, about where we're at in the season of God, that he's, he's bringing people to the watershed, to a watershed, a watershed moment. We've heard that from Dr. Morocco. There's moments that come that transform your life forever. They change literally the entire landscape is changed. And what I'm talking about, I'm talking about a spiritual watershed moment where God comes upon his people and his people hunger and yearn for him. And there's this confluence, there's this violence in the most holiest of ways that brings a complete transformation like a flash flood would come. A watershed. You ever heard that? Oh, that was a watershed moment for me. I've had many watershed moments. Some are stick out in my mind more than others. The United States has had many watershed moments. World War II On D-Day, on the beach of Normandy, was a watershed moment. 
Had we not gotten that victory, that breakthrough, had we not won with the Allies in World War II, you would also be speaking German. You, you are aware of that. Sounded more like Swedish to me. Yeah, yeah. There's moments that come. Elections. Breakthroughs. We just celebrated our nation's birthday. July 4th, 1776. The signing of the Declaration of Independence. It was a watershed moment. A document and a nation birthed not like any other nation. Oh, we have our woes, we have our difficulties, we have our problems. I believe that God is bringing us in the United States of America to a watershed moment, to a moment where God and His power is released upon us in such a way that it changes the very landscape of our nation. I believe that the, a fresh wind is blowing across America. I believe that we're headed for the greatest revival that there has ever been. I believe that God is intervening, intervening in the White House and in your house and in the outhouse. I think he's intervening in every single house. I believe that God is bringing us to a watershed moment. And I've seen, I've seen times where people completely miss, they completely miss a moment. I don't want to miss mine. And as a senior leader here under Dr. Morocco in Alaska, I will tell you that I have given my life to the fact that we're not going to miss it. So help me, God, I'm going to do everything I can. How about you? Will you do everything you can? You don't want to miss what God wants to do in this next season. So are you, are you concerned about it? Economic, no, I'm not concerned about any economic, I'm not concerned about any collapse or anything. We're getting stronger and stronger. We're increasing more and more. Why is that? Because we're connected to God, connected to his throne. He has no lack. Poverty and lack, you don't live here. Say that over your house. Poverty and lack, you don't live. Some of you need to drop, kick him right out your house. Pastor Vince is like, you going to split your pants? I'm like, uh-uh, I got stretchy pants on tonight. <laughs> Always wear these for revival so I can step over pews. We have no problem. Pastor Kirsten taught me that. <laughs> Come to the watershed, I've called it. Thank you, worship team. We're good. Stand up on your feet, Acts 9. Verse 1, New International Version. Then Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. So that if he found any who were of the way, notice it's capitalized, it's the name of the, the first church they called the way. Whether men or women, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? What a great prayer. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the city, and you'll be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And Saul arose from the ground. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. They led him by the hand and brought him to, into Damascus, verse 9. He was there three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. I think I'll stop there. Father, move in power. In Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle Paul is a picture of what I believe God is going to do to even the hardest-hearted person across America, even in your own family, maybe here tonight. He's going to touch 
people and transform them from Saul's and make them Paul's. I love what Rodney Howard Brown says. He got hit so hard by the Holy Spirit to knock the S off and put a P on. His life, understanding the Apostle Paul, his life, as it says in Philippians 3 and verse 4, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as of the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He hated the followers of Christ until that day where he had a watershed moment. What happened on the road to Damascus is he met the Lord. It wasn't just a psychological experience. It was a physical experience. It was a spiritual experience. It certainly affected his his psyche. Deeply affected him. When I was reading this text, I was reminded uh, of a, I think it's the last job I had before I went into full-time ministry. I was painting, painter, and uh, I worked for a man uh, who founded a very large furniture company and was very, very wealthy. And he had three large estates on one property and we would paint one and then move to the second one and then we were done with the second one move to the third. When we were done with the third, it was time to start at the first one again. And so I just worked there for him. He entrusted me at moving his Ming dynasty vases and, and articles of great value. And I remember what he said. You can move something, one thing at a time. One thing, not two. Repeat after me. One thing, not two. And so literally, if it was just a box, you didn't pick up a box and a vase, you picked up the box. And then you would walk and you would move it and you'd put it down. Very detailed. He was a backslidden Baptist missionary. Now, I only know that, that he was backslidden because he cursed a lot and and he drank, I'm pretty sure, and he didn't act like a Christian. But I come to understand that he was a missionary years ago and got wounded on the field, on the mission field. Not wounded like shot wounded, but spiritually wounded, which is sometimes worse. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you've been spiritually wounded. Got wounded by a leader and turned from serving God in full-time ministry. So I heard the whole story later. I was leaving one day the job and there was a, a guy that was a general contractor who was over all of us, and he had worked there for five years, and I had been working there for two, three houses, same three houses, remodeling, repainting, same three, one, two, three, start back at number one. And as I'm leaving, the contractor and the, the owner, this man, his name is Ed, they're talking, and I'm leaving, and so I, I said, Hey, guys, we'll see you later. God bless you. He says, oh, you're going to go to church this weekend? They're always making fun of me, always making fun. I said, yes, I can't wait. It's going to be amazing. And I I did. I answered just like that because it was amazing. And he said, oh, okay, let me ask you a question. I said, oh, all right. He said, "Uh, you know the story of the Apostle Paul? I said, yeah. He said, okay, tell me the story of the Apostle Paul. So I I tell him the story of the Apostle Paul getting saved, which is this story. And I made an error. I forget exactly what error I wasn't specific, specifically I made. I forget exactly, but he corrected me and he was right. I said, Oh, you're right. He said, Yeah, all of you guys, you're a holy roller, aren't you? I said, What do you mean? (laughs) I was all what do you mean? No, he he said, You're you're one of those holy rollers. You're that church down there in town, right? I go, oh, yeah. He said, you know, you holy rollers don't, usually don't even know the word. He was standing on a platform, and above his head was a light that they could not get to work. I mean, they rewired it I, I, twice, and it just had a problem, and they couldn't figure out where the problem was, and I think it just was this phantom light demon. <laughs> not really. Yeah, but just, it didn't work, and it was over his head. And uh, he's saying, you know, the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Huh. You're going to go to church, be a holy roller, don't even know the word. I go, holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. And he starts mocking. And he says, Holy Ghost, my foot. And the light goes on above his head. 
of which I think he might have soiled himself. I said, oh God, thank you. Amen, bye. And I closed the door. And I left. It did something into, in him. It, it, it affected him in a profound way, which he wasn't able to verbalize to me. I believe it was a moment for him, but it just awakened him to the fact that there is a God and there is a Holy Spirit and God is pouring out. God is doing amazing things. The Apostle Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, and there's no way to explain his transformation in life unless you explain it by saying he met the risen Savior. There's no other way to take somebody like that who is so zealous and so set and so rigid and a murderer at that who's then changed and becomes one of the leaders of the way that he used to mock and persecute? How do you, how do you explain that? He encountered Jesus. He had a watershed moment. And I said this morning that you, you and I, our nation doesn't need more religion. We don't need more tradition. We don't need more stiff-necked people who are just full of, they're full of themselves, full of pride, Give a bunch of rules and regulations, but actually don't model, don't demonstrate what Christ's likeness is or the love of God or the power of God. The Apostle Paul, Saul, got transformed because he met Jesus. The result of him meeting Jesus, and you can go and look this up in Acts 25, verse 16, talks about him being chosen. God's purpose and plan is revealed to him. Turn there, Acts 25. His testimony is told in numerous different places. Acts 25. Wow. Verse 15. Uh, no, take it from verse... Okay, he's before Agrippa, verse 13. After some days, King Agrippa, Bernice, came to Caesarea to greet Festus. It had been many days Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying there's a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking me for judgment against him. To them I answered, it is not a custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face. Go down to verse 17. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they, they brought no accusation against him of such things, I suppose. but had some questions about him regarding their own religion. Verse 20. And because I was uncertain of such things, I asked whether they were willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed to be reserved for the, the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would also like to hear this man myself. So the next day, verse 23, when Agrippa and Bernice had come a great pomp and entered the auditorium with the commanders, the city, Festus command, verse 24, Festus said, King Agrippa and all men who are present with us, you see this man about to be whom the whole assembly, the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me both in Jerusalem and here crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. Look at verse 
1 of chapter 26 as I lead, read on and on trying to find the verse I'm looking for. This is more Bible than some of you have read in a week. So it's good for you. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you're permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things which I am accused of the Jews by the Jews, especially because you are an expert in all the customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. And he goes on to detail his life and how he met the risen Savior. Look at verse 12. While thus occupied, I journeyed to Damascus. And that's the text we read in Acts 9. With the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun. Shining around me and all those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me, saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. Concentrate now. Listen up. Verse 16. To make you a minister and a witness of both the things of which you have seen and of the things of which I will yet Reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles and all who, and to all whom I am now sending you. To open their eyes, look at verse 18. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance amongst those who are being sanctified by faith in me. The result of Jesus giving the Apostle Paul, who was then Saul, a watershed moment, the result of that is the writing of three quarters of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul was an amazing man, unstoppable because he was given a vision. And he says later on to, to Agrippa, I've not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. God has a plan. He has a purpose for you. But I'll tell you, without an encounter from the Lord, you'll just not have the gas in the tank to get there. You need to have a watershed moment. God has a plan. Saul's watershed moment speaks to us very simply tonight, this. One, if God can change Saul, he can change the likes of you. <laughs> I said if God can change Saul, he could change me. He could change you. He can change anybody. If he could change Saul or murdering a Christian killer, he could change you. He could change your uncle. He could change your, your ugly ex-husband. Tell that Swede to settle down on that front row. The second thing is that conversions are real experience. Without sharing my whole story, the only thing that can explain, the only thing that it can explain my life, the only thing that it can explain the fact that I'm standing here right now is that I must have met God. Because my family, my father, my mother, professionals, all kinds of people helped me and spent untold thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to help me. Some of you don't know all that. And I'm not going to tell it all to you tonight. You'll have to read it in my book, which one day I will write. The only thing you could explain my life by, the transformation of my life is, there must be a God because that guy was gone. My father was a lawyer for 51 years and a Catholic. And he would have clients come in who struggled with the things I struggled with and had similar challenges that I had. 
and he would witness even though he wasn't born again. And he'd say, listen, here's what you need to do. You need to do what my son did. And they're like, what? You need to give your life to Jesus. They're like, what? What? Yeah, I know, I don't, I don't really understand it either, but if you give your life to Jesus. <laughs> no, seriously, that's a true story. That's true. And he would witness to the hardest-headed cases because he thought because my dad became a believer by watching a broken young man get transformed. I'm talking 25, 30 years ago. If God could change a soul, he could change you. He could change anybody. He can change anybody because conversion is real. God is real. No matter how ugly you might feel, no matter how shame-filled and guilt-ridden you might be, no matter what kind of bondage you came into this place, there's a living God who loves you and will set you free if you'll just call tonight could be a watershed moment for you. The third thing I see is that God's got a plan, and we know that from Scripture, Jeremiah, for I know the plans that I have for you. God has a plan for me. God has a plan for you. Come on, raise your right hand and say, God's got a plan for me. Yeah, he does. And fulfilling the purpose and plan that God has for your life will bring fulfillment, satisfaction, and if done According to his prescribed way, you will hear when you're dead before his throne, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Real success has nothing to do with money. Real success has nothing to do with worldwide impact. Real success has nothing to do with fame. It has everything to do that when you're dead and you're before the judgment seat, you're before the great throne of judgment, God says to you, well done. Live for that. Live. It makes every second of your life count. When you turn, you deny your flesh. When you turn the other cheek and you've run out of cheeks and you keep turning. And you keep doing the right thing and you keep giving and you keep praying and you keep yourself from being offended and you keep putting your hand to the plow and you don't look back becoming a pillar of salt and you contend and you pray and you believe and you stay filled with the Spirit, filled with joy overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony and loving your life not so much as it shrink from death. You live that life and you hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It will make all that you're suffering and all the things that you've had to overcome and all the ugly people that didn't like you, it'll make it all worth it. Don't live for this age. Live for another age. Live for the one that's coming. Be eternally minded. God has a plan for us. But you'll notice in, the, in, in, the, in chapter 9, and we didn't read it, but Paul didn't do it by himself. We had our leadership meeting just before this, as I mentioned. It's called a commission leaders meeting. Now, anybody can be a part of that. You have to go through some steps, but literally anybody can. You, you got to show up. You got to be faithful. You got to be loyal. I mean, you have to have character, of course, but we'll help you with all of that. You can have no character. Stick around. We'll help you. More than that, the Holy Spirit will help you. And God's looking for leaders. He's looking for people. There's so many spiritual orphans that bounce around from church to church to church to church to church to church and practice their gifts that only work on Sunday, which makes me wonder about their gifts. That was stinking good right there. You guys aren't amening. Let me say it again. I'll say it slower. I've seen so many people go from church to church, to church, practicing their spiritual gifts that only work on Sunday. And if your gifts only work on Sunday, I wonder about your gifts. God wants to use you seven days a week. And if you don't get rooted and grounded in a church, and I'm not saying it has to be this one, I'm biased. I like this place, pretty amazing, amazing people. But there are other great churches and other great pastors and other great leaders. But you have to find a home church. Why? Because the Apostle Paul couldn't do it by himself. He needed an Ananias. This guy that he's never mentioned again in all of Scripture, some guys, he's praying, and and the Lord speaks to him and says, go lay your hands on Osama bin Laden. Now, Osama bin Laden is dead. Maybe we should pick somebody else, but... He's go lay your hands on a terrorist. But he had paid the price of discipleship. He understood God's voice, had an encounter with God to understand that 
this man, Saul, is born again because the Lord told me, and I'm supposed to go lay hands on him. And I believe that when he laid hands on him, I believe the apostle Paul was baptized in the Holy Ghost. I believe he began to pray in tongues, and scales fell from his eyes. We didn't, we didn't see that. Listen, there are, we didn't read that. There's, three, there's people three days blind in our world looking for an Ananias looking for somebody who will lay their hands on him, looking for somebody to build relationship with. And if you don't build relationship and you're not accountable and you're not transparent, I love what our one brother visiting from, thank you for the encouragement. You encouraged me. Visiting from Oregon, welcome to the promised land. Alaska. We love Oregon. Oregon needs a great outpouring. And God is doing it in certain places. Portland needs the power of the Holy Ghost. God, intervene in Portland. Intervene in Oregon. Intervene, God, even tonight, in the name of Jesus. He said, he said to me, and I'll roughly quote you, he said, you were transparent, you were real. I like that. Don't stop that. You know, I don't know how to do anything else. And they tell you in seminary, which is many times a cemetery, you might get that on the way home for, for pastors and leaders. They tell you not to be too transparent. And I think you can be a little bit over the top. I push the envelope on that. But transparency. People need to know. Not, not just about me, about you. They need to know that you're real and you struggle with stuff and you're overcoming and, and you're more than a conqueror. And they need to see their people are watching you. All kinds of people are watching you. But well, they should mind their own business. They're looking for freedom. They're looking for help. They're looking for, they're looking for an Ananias. And I believe that God is giving us watershed moments like this morning. This morning, God's power hit the place, especially at the 11 o'clock. Those of you that go to the 9, keep going to the 9. There's no room in the 11. The power got hit the 9 o'clock too. But he always comes in different dimensions. The power of God, the presence of God is here. What are you saying? I'm telling you, you need people. He said, I don't like them. I understand. <laughs> but we need people. We need relationship. I'm so grateful for my staff. I'm so grateful for the, they're, they're, we're friends. We're family. We're not, you know, we're not a staff like a normal staff. Some of you, some of you don't really understand that. But I, I've been in churches where everybody's a hireling. Do you understand what that is? There's hireling and there's shepherds. There's two different kinds of leaders. We don't hire hirelings. Let me say, can I work for the church? No. You know how you get to work, you know how you get to flowing in that? Serve. And don't worry about it. Love God, love people, serve. Be a part of it, be a part of a team, be a part of a life group, do everything you can for the glory of God. And then if the Lord opens up a door that way, that, then, then it'll open. But I'm so grateful because we're family. You need Ananias, Paul, Saul, Ananias, you need a Saul. We all need each other. We need relationships. Can you say amen? We need accountability. I believe that the Lord has brought us to a watershed moment and the Sauls of the world are going to become the Pauls of the world. If you believe that, say amen. amen. I spoke this morning about a hike I did with a group called The Unit. And it was a, a summer program for about four weeks. And I'm going to ask Minister David to come in a moment. It was a summer program for about four weeks. It was over, uh, a group of kids came and they went through this four week program. Yep, you're up, Minister David. Ready? And in that time, they had scripture memorization. And Minister David tell you a little bit more about it, but I was able to go with them, and I realized God is raising up an army of kids. He's raising up an army of, of youth and young adults and, and middle-aged people. I bet. And seniors. Because the world needs to have an encounter with Jesus. The whole world needs a visitation. 
And you, ladies and gentlemen, will many times be the only Jesus people ever meet. Have a watershed moment with God. Some of that, I think, is dependent on the sovereignty of God, but also he responds to the hunger that you have. And if you found yourself in church and you're like, I can't wait till the bald white guy shuts up, you probably have an issue. He wants to change you from a Saul to a Paul. He wants to transform you and give you an encounter and a plan and relationship and accountability so that you can change your community, so that you can change your family, so that you can change the world. Do you believe that? Say amen. Thanks for listening to this message today. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you realize that you need Jesus as your Savior, and you'd like to pray with me to either commit your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me and bringing me forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them today and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me of all my sin. I commit to live for you all the rest of the days of my life. And I pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, would you text the word SAVED to 907-357-2065? We'd like to send you some information and some materials that will help you in your Christian walk. God bless.